Rolling Dice and Taking Names is sponsored by The Broken Token, creator of high-quality gaming accessories and storage solutions. Visit them online at thebrokentoken.com. Hey, y'all. On this episode of RDTN, Ignacy comes on the show to tell us about Portal's upcoming game, Alien Artifacts. Plus, the guys review the abstract game number nine. I know how Ignacy loves cookies. I sure hope there wasn't an incident this year at Gen Con. Uh... Hello, and welcome back to Rolling Dice and Taking Names, the fully recovered podcast from Gen Con, sponsored by the Dice Tower Network. Full of energy, this is Tony. And this is Marty. And this is episode number 127, number nine, number nine. Number nine. It's one two seven. Number nine. Okay, it's one twenty seven, and the title is yeah. number nine of a great Beatles song. Okay, hold on, stop. What? Uh, looking over our show notes, I see nothing about having Chaz Marler from Paradise Paradise on. And typically, when we do a Beatles song, he's on the show. Wait a minute, did I break some contract or something? Uh, hold on, uh, we're gonna get in trouble. I- I'll take care of this. Hold, hold, hold on, just hey, hey, come here for a second. I'm here. I made it. I made it. Sorry, 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 I'm late, but no. Ooh. All right, sorry. <laughs> My flight was delayed. I'm sorry I'm late, but I'm here. I'm here now, okay? It's not easy to make it all the way from Oregon to North Carolina on such short notice, but uh, but I'm here. Uh, okay, that's good, Chaz. Thanks. We fulfilled our requirement. Continue, Tony. That is right. This is the recovery episode from Gen Con, where we finally got the chance to sit down and play some of the goodness. Marty, I was so excited to get some shrink wrap off of some games. Yes, and then have to go through the part of opening up rule books and trying to read rules and then teach rules to all these new games, which that's becoming a chore for me. It really is. I, I, some people love to dig into rule books, Tony. I'm becoming one of those people that I do not like doing that anymore. I I know you're feeling when I, when you, you know, you got that anticipation of pulling that top off of that game and out spills either this heavy funk from a rule book or, Oh, look, it's a nice pamphlet and and, and you have a different feeling, don't you? (laughs) It is. So, for example, uh, one of the games we're going to be talking about today, number nine, is that nice pamphlet, right? Yeah. It's the, uh, it's the front back page. Oh, I think I could do this. But another one we're just going to touch it on, too. Uh, Dragonfire, that was a tome. Yes. Wow. That was a big book you had over there. So, Dragonfire, Marty, this word says this. Flip, 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 flip. <laughs> oh, I found it. Here it is. Defi- now. You know, Shadowrun Crossfire. We we talked about this many, 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 many moons ago. Yes. But Dragonfire, we were very excited to get this because we know the system. So I was sitting there thinking, I got nothing to learn. Oh, crud. Yeah. Well, you know, when we talked about we were very excited about Shadowrun Crossfire when it came out. Deck building game in the Shadowrun universe, which both you and I really enjoyed. And the game was like almost there, right? It was a deck building game that fell a little short on theme because it felt like you were just matching colors but i think what really bothered a lot of people was it was a hard game Mm -hmm. and it was one of those things you had to grind the same scenario over and over again in order to get xp to upgrade your guys to move to further scenarios so when they announced catalyst game labs was going to be doing a DD version of this i was very excited but tentative because i was like okay are you just slapping DD on this or is this going to add a lot of new mechanics to it? So you and I got together with a couple other guys the other night, and we played basically the first scenario just to kind of get our, you know, dig into it and see how it works. And I must say they've added a couple mechanics to this game that I personally like better. Forget whether you like D&D or Shadowrun better. I mechanically think this is a better game than the original. I, I cannot wait to do the campaign. You know, I wanted to do the campaign for the Shadowrun, but this, I definitely want to do the campaign. I want to put stickers on cards. I want to build up my character because, yeah, I agree with you. It was, 
it wasn't as what I felt convoluted. Now there were some sticky points, you know, don't, yes. yeah, don't give it me wrong here, but it wasn't anything that I couldn't overcome. I understood, you know, just got to play the colors, got to do the deck building. It was very simple from that standpoint. But one thing that threw me off was that event deck. You were just flipping over cards left and right. And I was like, what are you doing? Why is this set up? But I finally got the grasp of that where these event cards were setting various levels. That was neat. I like that. Well, Crossfire had that too. At the uh, beginning of each, the first player's turn, each round flips over this card. In this case, it's called a Dragonfire card, which is some sort of effect that lasts the entire round. And when that card goes into the discard pile, you're actually increasing uh, the level of the Dragonfire deck. And there are some cards that say if the level is three or four or higher, then it makes it progressively harder. So that's how they make the game harder over the course of the game as your character gets better. Um, that's one of those things I kept, maybe I for, would forget to flip the deck or you had to read how to resolve that card. But a couple of things that they added into this that I really like. One is locations. D&D, when you think about that, you think adventurers, you have mages and clerics and fighters and rogues going together on an adventure. And this actually has location cards. Where we're all starting out in one place, but the uh, encounter deck, which gives you monsters also brings out locations that you can move your guys between so thematically if you're in somebody's location you help them fight with the you can help fight the other monsters and work together if you're not in their location you can't you can always travel there so there's this idea of moving around and helping each other out and moving the party or splitting the party that i really like yes i, I like that too now it was kind of interesting on the assist mechanism and where you could do that even if you weren't in the same location. But I, I'm with you. I enjoyed the encounter. I liked having those locations come up. And there was this aspect of a tripwire. If you do damage, then something else happens uh, down the card. That was really neat. I mean, it's just, okay, hey, look, here's a tripwire. So you've set off a trap. Right. Even though it was just a icon on the card, a line on the card. I like that. There, there was something that made me think about, I, oh, I just, oh, I killed this big mega dude and he fell across a tripwire or I stepped into the room and I didn't notice the laser beam. Okay. There wasn't a laser beam. This is D and T, but you know, there's a wire across there or a stone that's kindly slightly lifted up and I tripped it off and caused something bad to happen. It was so simple, but yet it did bring me into the theme and I don't know why it shouldn't have, but it did. <laughs> it shouldn't have. Yeah, the, the way you deal damage is just like it was with Crossfire. So everybody basically has a, you start with a deck of cards, Cleric's green, Rogue's red, Mage is blue, and Martial Arts, the fighter, is black. And the encounters, the, the, you have to deal damage based on color. So you have, may have a monster comes out and says, you need to do two green damage, a blue damage, and a red damage. And when you play your cards, your cards have abilities on them, but they also could provide a certain amount of that color damage. And in this case, it's kind of very puzzle-ish, right? That was my big issue with the original Crossfire. It felt like in a puzzle without a theme. There is still a little bit of a puzzle element here of trying to, okay, Tony, if you can help me with this and deal enough damage on this, when it gets to Mark's turn, he can use a green and deal another point of damage and maybe we can get rid of this guy. So very much a co op -y game. You still have to work together. But I, I think once you get uh, these rules down, these little nuances down, it'll flow a lot quicker. And we, the thing I want to play the campaign like you, Tony, is because we didn't get to experience the whole, okay, we finished our adventure. Tony, you get this much XP. I get this much XP. Let's go shopping. And there's these cards, there's these magic item, uh, items that you can get to add to your deck. There are these abilities where you can spend a certain amount of XP to open up additional uh, ability sections on your cards so you can apply new stickers to your cards and get new abilities. That's the exciting part of the game that I really want to check out, which is why we're not really reviewing it, because that's a big part of the game that we need to experience. You cannot go wrong when there is a game that has an appetizer in it. When, when there was blue salad or blue cheese salad, <laughs> red salad, and then I had to encounter death salad. <laughs> so, but hey, hey, whoa, 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 wait, wait, buddy, whoa, whoa. And I put that on my weekly Instagram post about how I got eaten up by salad. <laughs> and it, yeah. without careful reading, that's what you thought. And somebody came back to me and said, I completely agree with you on that. We call them salads too. 
<laughs> that, oh, that's funny. Okay, so they're called what? Uh, S L A A D. Yes, yeah, slods. Slods. Slod. Slods. I have. A, I guess I haven't played enough D and D. I didn't know what a slod was, but it was true, Tony. As soon as these cards coming out, you, I mean, you flip two letters, it's salad. So salad. The, the whole time, we're like, green salad, blue salad, death. It was just funny. It was, and death salad ate my lunch. He did. <laughs> oh my! And then Marty pulls out a card, and yes, yeah, spoiler. Okay, you can skip ahead, people. Spoiler. But anyway, there's this one card in the upper deck. It says, kill the rabbit. All right, it didn't say kill the rabbit, but you, it's, there's one that does that. That's. So, I thought we were going to win until you spawned all these. Oh, wait a minute. What do you mean kill the rabbit? It doesn't do that, but you know what I mean. I don't know what you okay, mean. Okay, it was, was kill there. the wizard. I was trying not to spoil it. Okay, it doesn't matter. This is just an encounter deck. Yeah. People run across yeah. this stuff. It was kill the wizard. That sucked. That was the wizard. And you know what was uh, interesting was we were very close to winning. We were within one round of winning the game, and all of a sudden, it got back to me and had to flip over one of those dragon fire cards, and all heck broke loose. It's like, okay, if you have this amount of cards in your discard pile, then this happens, and you draw this card, and if you draw this pick your color, this happens. All, next thing I knew, there were four monsters in front of me, and then we just died off one by one, and we were dead. So I, I will say that even though we lost, I do feel the game was easier than mm -hmm. the crossfire because i remember when we played crossfire it would maybe over in like two rounds it felt like and, and if that card had appeared sooner it wouldn't have been as deadly so maybe that's a con we'll have to you know keep playing and see what we think from that standpoint and i love the fact they've already come out with packs okay oh huge character packs with a bunch of bards packs. in there yeah so yeah. here's the thing I, we were excited about dragon fire uh, we got a chance to play it. If you enjoyed Crossfire, I highly recommend you at least look at this one because if you like the elements of Crossfire, this adds to it. Both Tony and I, even after just one game, I think it's a better game. The art on it is great. I think thematically, uh, uh, mechanically, mechanically, I think it matches the theme a whole lot better. That's Dragonfire by Catalyst Games Lab. It'll be coming out, I believe, sometime in September. It was a Gen Con. It was a hot item at Gen Con. So I can't wait, Tony, for you and I to sit down and play with Mark and the other guys and and uh, play through a campaign and see how this thing goes. When you were talking about all the colors, the mages and all, I kept going back to Lucky Charms. You know, blue diamonds, green horseshoes or whatever it was. You were talking about blue wizards, red rogues, all that. For some odd reason, I was like, is he talking about Lucky Charms? You know, you remember that. Purple diamonds, whatever the, the thing was. I've lost Blue it. salads, green salads. Exactly. I'll, but that reminds me, over at our BGG Guild, number 1589, poll. That just gave me a poll. What's your favorite cereal? I had to put that out there. That's a good one. That's a, you better not screw this up. You better put enough on there so that people aren't picking other. And I, maybe I'll put a lot of check boxes instead of one. Yes, thank you. People want multiple choices sometimes. But just, sometimes in life, you have to make a hard decision. <laughs> you can't. You can't just. Oh, I'll take this and this and this. Sometimes you've got to select. You've got to choose who to kick off the island. It's a, it's a survivor serial style. There you go. So uh, over on Kickstarter, we received the prototype for the follow-up to Mintworks. We got Mint Delivery, which is a pickup and delivery game. Now, um, I'd never played Mintworks. I don't think you've ever had the opportunity to play Mintworks, did you? I have not. All right. So I appreciate 524 Labs sending me a prototype of that. And I, was, I pulled it out, a small 10 little game, put in your pocket type game. I like it's it's cute. Anyway, it's ten dollars on Kickstarter. I mean, basically, you're going around and you are trying to transport. You, you created it in Mintworks. You created the mints. Now you've got to go out and deliver the mints. And by doing the various combinations of changing, like, oh, I got nothing but three Mentos. I need to get a cinnamon Mentos. I'm going to just use that. Then you got to go to the various factories and let them change it around. And then you have customer requests out in the field, and you drive your little truck around. Really cute pickup and delivery game for ten dollars. I put this out for my. Um, what would you call a gaming group, Marty, that isn't a heavy gaming group, but you don't want to insult them and say, you know, a uh, not so good game, gaming, you know, a lighter game, lighter gaming group, I guess. Would that be a good uh, word? Uh, cas casual? Is that offensive? Casual gaming? I think casual. Casual, gamers? Yeah. casual, I think works. So I pulled this out for my casual gaming group. And for me, I mean, I was able to put it out there, went over the rules, very simple rules, and they picked up on it real quick. Now, this is not a heavy thinker, people. Don't think that this is going to be a big old, you know, oh, I got to do this and this and this. No, it's real simple. You're delivering mints. But for $10, quick bar game, neat. Um, definitely go check it out. It's 520. It's neat. It's neat. It has to be neat. Okay. 
We're gonna have. You know what we need to do? Um, every time, everybody <laughs> drink like, neat. Every time somebody say neat, I need to like put a little sound in there or okay. something like I, that. I promised myself when we were going to do these recordings, I was going to limit the amount of time I said neat. But forget <laughs> it. I, I can't do it. It's like saying <laughs> anyway. Oh, that's oh, that so frustrates me when I listen to our shows. Five. Oh, sorry. Back to the Kickstarter. Five twenty four labs. It's on Kickstarter right now. Get over there quick. Because if you don't, you'll miss it. I mean, it's already funded. I mean, my gosh, it's got 85K already in the bank right there with almost 5,000 backers. And as of this recording gets released, it's probably going to be around 15 days left. Oh, I'm sorry, about 10 days left. So be sure to check it out. Speaking of teaching rules, um, I suck. You, you taught us a game. You, <laughs> you taught us a, another game the other night when we got together. Hafiz Grand Bazaar. And, and what was it? Gaston kept trying to break out um, the Aladdin song. Da, da, da. Like anyway, can you find that one? Can you can you insert the Aladdin song here? The Aladdin song. There are a lot. Of, there were a lot of Aladdin songs. Yeah, don't, don't do that. Don't, I don't want to pay Disney anything. Yeah, don't pay Disney anything. I was worried I was going to, have to pull out the uh, Sound of Music songs uh, on the last <laughs> Gen Con episode because I didn't want to get with copyright you know, issues. Uh, but after after hearing y'all sing, I went, never mind. Nobody recognize those. Recognize those anyway. Yeah, doe. Uh, dear, any uh -oh. time you want me to sing, I'll be happy to do it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, Hafid's Grand Bazaar. This followed out. Oh, well, actually, this was a, sort of like an appetizer, kind of like a salad. We put this on the table because it was going to be a quick game, and it was my job to learn it. This is from Rather Dashing Games. Now, we talked about Element on a previous show were from rather dashing which i really really enjoy i can't sometime marty we gotta play this but i've played this multiple times a good old game kind of like uh, rose king thinking game but Gr hafiz grand bazaar is a mm, a game what, what would you say set collection type game uh i guess set collection maybe a little bit of bidding there's trading i don't know it's funny that when you think of those i think of these bazaars that they they show on the movies that are out you know in the middle east where there's a lot of bartering and stuff like that i, I kind of get that feeling it's like you're going around and you're buying goods and then you're going out to people and say hey I'll, I'll give you one of these for one of those it seems to have that sort of element to it so yeah i think i guess the core of the game is set collection right uh you got these resource cards that you're trying to collect the ones that are the same, a uh, complete set of the five different colors, or each of the colors has five different items on the cards, and you try to collect each of those individual items within that set of colors, and they all uh, provide different uh, levels of victory points. And over the course of the game, it's, you're trying to collect those resources, trade them, and uh, so at the end of the round, you can turn those in for points. And after four rounds, well, with four players, four rounds, uh, you count up your points and the person with the most is the, uh, winner. Yeah. Now it's not victory points. No, it's not who has the most victory points. It's who has the most talent coins, which are square, mm, yes. which are square. I mean, during a round, there's essentially four things you're doing. You're bidding on spots on at the Grand Bazaar. You're bidding to go to the caravans. You're bidding on being able to use various buyers. You're well, no, anybody can use the buyers. You're bidding to use the informant. You're doing that mechanism. And, okay. I know I'm not the best at teaching a game. And I understand that. You think? I know that. But I think there has now been a, a negative thing. Whenever I start teaching a game, people kind of tune me out. They say, oh, well, <laughs> well, he'll never. Donna does this. I think you do this. It's like, oh, my gosh, McCree's going to teach a game. We're not going to learn it. He's going to screw up the rules. And there's this negativity out there. And so I, I am discounted for trying. So I, I'm sitting there. I'm going over. I've learned the rules. I've played the game solo. I am trying my best to teach it. And I can just look across the table and everybody's like, yeah, whatever. And I'm like, okay, Hafiz Grand Bazaar. So what? I missed one rule and I'm getting slack from Kale about, oh, how did Gaston discover that? I'm like, it's on the freaking board. Read the board. Well, you're supposed to tell me that. Oh. Yeah, the, the rules for this one were, I guess, in between number nine and uh, uh, Dragonfire. But I do like pretty much when either you or I are teaching the rules, uh, Mark Hell, who's on our Scurry Report segment, typically ends up going, can I look at the rule book? And when somebody says, can I look at the rule book? It's not because they want to see the art or anything like that. It's because they want to go behind and check and make sure you're teaching it right. You, you came up with a good question and it wasn't spelled out in the rules. So you I, I sometimes I feel like, like in Hafiz, in this game, in, in Hafiz, when you're bidding on a spot, you place a cube down and the next person who wants to bid on that caravan has to increase their bid. Well, you asked a excellent question, sir. You said, 
Now, can I bid on that spot again? And your question was really, does that cube that I already put count towards my bid? And I said, no. And then I said, yes. And then I got confused. So I went back to the rules and basically you have to be bidding higher than the previous person. Yeah, and your cubes are almost like uh, workers, right? Because yeah. uh, when you place, you're, you're placing in, in bidding spots, like I want to bid first, bid second, et cetera. Or you may want to go to a location where it says, you know, uh, I'm going to get this ability to where when it's my turn to take one of these face down piles on the cards to put in my hand, if I have put a cube here, it will allow me to look at the cards beforehand or look at all of one color that we can kind of decide, you know, which one you might want to pick up to, coll to collect your sets. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another place you could put your cube that says when somebody uh, claims a pile of cards from the bidding process, you could take the top two cards off the top of the deck, which is another way to get resources. And one important one that I screwed up on the last <laughs> round is... Oh, that's hilarious. I'm glad you think that's funny. It was funny. There's this one location that says, you know, I want to initiate trades. Now, you if you don't have a cube there, you can still be part of a trade, but you can't initiate it. So if Tony puts a cube there and I don't, he can come to me and say, Marty, do you have this? Do you want to trade this? We can do, I can participate in that, but I can't go to him and do that. So uh, part of this game is, like I said, there's this one uh, set collection mechanic where you're trying to get all five resources of one particular color. And I was one away from it. And on the last round, it's like, okay, I'm just going to do a trade and get that last one and score myself 30 points. So we placed all their cubes on the board and then we start you start resolving you do the bids first and you kind of go around the board and resolve each location one at a time when we get to the trade section nobody had placed cubes there which means no trading will happen at that time which means marty will not get that last card he needs to get that final 30 points which means marty came in second by like 15 points and would have won other hand otherwise but that rule was covered up front multiple times, I must say. It was. No, no, I totally agree. <laughs> I just forgot. I know. I, because every time somebody had gone to that area, and sometimes I just didn't put a cube there thinking somebody will go there and I'll somehow be a part of a trade somehow. But when nobody went there on their last turn, and by the way, when you score, you've also got to put cubes. It's like, I'm going to put a cube here to be able to score on this type of set mm -hmm. collection. I want to put a cube here to score on this type of set collection. So you also have to put little cubes to indicate how you're going to score at the end of the round. You know, it's one of those games that um, the first half of the game is very, very interactive, right? right. Uh, there's a little bit of take that because it's like, uh, you know, Tony, I'm gonna, Tony puts two cubes on the bid one spot. I put three cubes there. I trump him. Basically, then he doesn't get that. Uh, you can, you can, uh, like I said, with the worker placement thing, you can uh, take over spots that other people can't get to. So there's a little bit of take that. Then in the trading part, the, the table, everybody's talking, right? Hey, I need sheep. No, I need, I need some stone or some ore. Hey, you got a blue card you're willing to give me? So all this is going on for a few minutes. And then at that point, it becomes like almost like a solitaire game, meaning uh, you're going to be scoring all those point sections, the different types of set collections. Everybody's kind of going, looking at their hand of cards, creating their little sets, collecting points, and then you move on to the next round. So if you're looking for a game that's a good mix of a lot of interaction, some take that, a lot of table talk, but then there's this little part where, you know, okay, I need to kind of sit by myself and decide how I'm going to play this out. This, this really works well and thematically i think it's a pretty cool little game too because even though a set collection the idea of the the bidding and the bantering and the trading it is kind of all fits for some odd reason marty i when we were done i felt like it fell flat and because i think a lot of it has to deal with the group on the interaction but i thought about it afterwards i'm like you know this is for my casual group this might be a fun game if they will interact i i, I completely agree with you about your complete assessment on this i i was like Okay, how is this thing going to play out later? Am I going to get it to the table more often? I think as people get to learn more about the strategy of it, I think it would be a fun game, and I think the trading would kick in a lot more. So I thought, hey, it fell flat, but I did enjoy it. So I was like, okay, this is a cute game from Rather Dashing, Hafiz Grand Bazaar. I was like, wow, I didn't teach it very well. I tried to teach it very well. I felt people were ignoring me while I was teaching it. But overall, y'all picked up on it as we played. So I, yeah. I felt kind of like, hey, I didn't do so bad, but I'll keep working on teaching a game. Speaking of sharing things, a, a friend of ours of the show, Michael Legg, who we had uh, ran into at Gen Con and actually got our last moon pie leaving from the airport. 
shared some nice little treats with Tony and I. I got a package uh, last Saturday, uh, and he, he contacted me and said, by the way, there's a, there's a package coming from me. Let me know when you get it. Now, Tony, I must say, when, you, when somebody just out of the blue says, I have a package, let me know when you get it. You, you, and there's a little bit of concern, right? You don't know what's going to be in there. No, you don't. I'm not saying Michael's going to do anything bad or anything like that, but it's like, what could it be? I was pleasantly surprised because he sent us these treats that I had heard people talk about before called, well, it looks like it said Stroop Waffles, but they're Dutch treats, so I, I assume they're pronounced Stroop, Stroop Waffle or something like that? Just stop. Just stop. Don't embarrass you. Just, well, it, well, it, it, well, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to be correct here. Okay. I don't want to say a Stroop Waffle. Okay, fine. Stroop Waffle? Anyway. But they're these little treats, the Dutch treats that I've seen before. They're like little uh, circular, almost like a cookie, but they're really soft. And they have a waffle. They look like little mini waffles. And there's two tiny little uh, waffle layers with a little filling in between. And he sent us caramel and he sent us honey. And the idea is that you're supposed to take a hot cup of coffee or tea and you take one of these uh, Stroop waffles and put it on top and leave it there for like a minute or so where it gets nice and warm and moist and you eat it with your coffee and your tea. Oh my gosh, those things are so good. So he sent us a few boxes and I brought them over the other night while we we're playing these games. And I said, Tony, you know, Michael was nice enough. He sent us some. So here's your, you know, a couple boxes for you to enjoy. So Tony opens these things up <laughs> and he says, let's, let's start passing these things out. And he looks at it. And he says, there, there's only four. He, he starts taking them out, eating them. He says, man, I can him. There's only four to a box. And I went, what are you talking about? Four to a box. There's, there's more than that. Cuz over here was taking out two at a time and making like a Stroop waffle sandwich and cramming these things in his mouth. I was like, dude, there's, you're eating two at one time. Make it though go longer if you just one at a time. And then everybody else followed suit and we're eating two at a time till we ran out. Hey, double decker moon pies. Why not double decker Stroop waffles? Plus, we didn't have any hot beverages. All I had was uh, Coke Zero, which I'm not a fan of the new taste as much as I am the old taste, so I'm going to have to savor that. But yes, Michael, I was eating Double Deckers, and I needed the sugar rush because we were fixing to battle a dragon in Dragon Fire against Death Sally. <laughs> yeah. So, Tony, did you try the, ca the caramel? I can't remember. Yeah, I, I tried them both that night. What did you like better? I'm, I'm, uh, I think the honey. Honey was one of my favorites. Yeah, honey. Me too. I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a honey guy. I, I really, in fact, I had one before we started recording this morning. I'm now savoring these things. So I got me a, a glass of iced tea, not hot tea. And I had me a little stroop waffle before we started recording. So I'm, I'm feeling good right now. So Michael, thank you so much for those. Those were, those were a treat. Was not expecting that. Uh, that was really good. And so great seeing you at the show. And Tony, I will say, just because you referenced this earlier, I am okay with the Coke Zero Sugar. I'm okay with it. I'm not going to throw up a, a big old protest against it. I'm going to enjoy it, but I still like the old taste. But then I'm old school. I like both. Now I wish I had one beside each other so I could side-by-side -side compare them. To me, when I first had Zero Sugar, to me it had a little bit of an aftertaste. But it seems like the initial taste tastes more like a, a regular Coke. So what, I've got an old case. It's uh, sitting in the garage ready to go. So I will bring over and we will do a blind taste test next time we get together. I like this. See, this is exciting. New games, playing new games. That's okay. But doing a blind taste test of Coke Zero and Zero Sugar Coke, that's exciting. This episode is going to drop. And shortly after it, one of my favorite days is going to occur in September. Talk like a pirate day. Arrgh! I'm excited. I love that day at work. They they know. Is that really one of your favorite days? Or are you just playing? This? No, I do. I enjoy because at work, all my emails have an arg or or I will convert them over to pirate stuff. You know, not not important emails. I don't send out instructions to my employees, but I will send out like you know little notes that will have it. Or I will convert. I'll go to talk like a pirate converter website to convert some things, and I'll always IM people in pirate talk because I really do enjoy this day. Just I don't know why, because I think we should all talk like a pirate for one day because it's so much fun. Well, you know what? There's people in the board game community that also feel the same way. And uh, a friend of ours, Tim uh, Bressman, who you've probably seen on uh, videos, uh, Dad versus Daughter. He has the Dad versus Daughter uh, show where uh, he uh, reviews games, he and his daughter. Let's see. Talk Like a Pirate Day is September 19th. But on the Saturday before that, 
uh, September 16th, I believe, uh, is going to be like play like a pirate day. Well, I guess any day could be that we could be play like a pirate day, but the idea is to play like a pirate. So not only are you talking, but maybe playing pirate themed games and Tony, I'm going to put you on the spot. Cut, give me a pirate themed game. Go skull King. Oh, look at you. You pulled it right out the top of your head. So there's a lot. I was thinking Merchants and Marauders. Merchants and Marauders. Uh, I, I have rum and bones here mm -hmm. that I think would be great for a pirate theme game. Rattle battle, grab the loot. Yeah, see? See, they're out there. So he's sponsoring this Play Like a Pirate Day. So uh, <laughs> for some of you, you may think, okay, this is going to be very annoying to get with a bunch of people and not only play like a pirate, but talk like a pirate all the day. But other people will totally embrace this. So he actually has a web put uh, uh, a Facebook page called Play Like a Pirate Day out there if you want to go and join and uh, see some of the games that you might be interested in playing that day and uh, get out there with your friends and play and talk like a pirate. Yeah, I have to do it early because because like you said, it was on Sunday, so I'm gonna have to do the. I would do the emails early or that arg that week. Arg arg. Do you think pirates really said arg, or is that just from the movies? I'm gonna bet it's from the movies. I, but I, it's probably from the movies. Did the, the forsooth and things like that for the back in the day? Who knows? We weren't there. Who cares? <laughs> we weren't there. Who cares? Who cares? I mean, it's <laughs> a great attitude. Yeah, what can I? What can I say? But you know what? What? It's neat to say it. First Martians is out, but Ignacy is not resting on his laurels. As right now, he has pre-orders up for his new game coming out at Essen, Alien Artifacts. This is a card-based engine building game in light of maybe like 51st State or Imperial Settlers that Tony and I just love. And this is right now on his website to pre-order at portalgames.pl. But here, I can't do it justice. So how about this? How about if we bring on Ignacy right now to tell us more about Portal Games and Alien Artifacts? It's been over a year. But he has made time for us. He has come back. He has survived his con. He has survived all the cons he's been to. I mean, he's been in America at Dice Tower. He went to Atlanta. He put us aside and didn't come see us. He <laughs> then goes to Gen Con. And the man is so busy. We just barely got to see him a few times just getting some food. But Ignacy is back on the show. And we are so excited. Ignacy, welcome back to Rolling Dice and Taking Names. Thank you for taking time, working on all the stuff you're doing, your expansions, your new games to come on the show. My gosh, let the man talk. No, I don't want to. He, he, he has his own incredible podcast with oh, Stephen Lord. Bonacore where he doesn't get to talk there. Why should he talk on our show? He doesn't get to talk on that one. Well, that's true okay ignacy <laughs> what's up thank you for having me uh yeah that was nice introduction thank you so much uh yes i'm back i'm back yes except we found out when we first got on he said i just want to let you guys know that i was playing terraforming mars we just finished but I don't know who won because I had to stop the scoring and come do this interview. So we are holding in uh, Ignacy in anticipation to see whether he won terraforming Mars or not. Mary won. We know Mary won. Yes, if I lost or no, because it looks like I lost, so we'll see. Well, I got to ask, were you playing with the new expansion, Hellas and Elysium? No. No, I, Terraforming Mars for me is a still very new game because the last year I spent uh, developing my games, uh, First Martians and Alien Artifact. So actually now after these games are on the market or nearly at the market, I'm catching up with the, all the games that I missed for the couple of last months. So Terraforming Mars, it is now my fifth game. So I'm still discovering this game uh, like a newbie. So this is this is always designers have this delay in discovering new stuff because they were developing games before. Did you at least grab the new expansion? No, 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 no. Still enjoying the base game and I wait for the Polish edition of the expansion. So not yet. Oh, okay. Because the, the expansion is just a brand new board, which I highly recommend. And I'm surprised your good friend Steven just didn't give you one while you saw him at Gen Con. But hey. You are surprised, really? <laughs> Oh, well, that's how they, they, they do this big trade thing where they come and bring games and, you know, a $20 board versus a incredible first Martian game. I don't think that's a fair trade myself. Yeah, yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah. So how was Gen Con for you? Did you have a big time? Did, how did the seminars go? Gen Con was, of course, of course, it was a blast. And with seminars, I think I put myself in a, a lot of work because I was working at the booth for the whole vendor day and then actually run to the other hotel to run seminars, then run a seminar and then uh, run for the dinner and uh, some rest. And actually during the Saturday, at Saturday, we ran uh, First Martians lounge party. So we ended up the convention day after the midnight, mm, uh, super, super tired. But it was uh, amazing. These are four days you are waiting for the whole year. So the, it is good to be busy. It is good to be tired because this is something you will be remembering for man, many, many months afterwards. So yes, uh, at the booth, super busy, lots of uh, people who have chance to meet me only once a year at the Gen Con. So lots of uh, nice talk with the fans of Portal Games. Then seminars, as you mentioned, we, we had uh, three seminars, one for the retailers. I was talking how to create the interesting events for the customers. One Portal Games keynote when I was talking about the behind the stuff, behind the curtain stuff about Portal Games or so anecdotes from the office. And then uh, game designer workshop in which I was complaining how designing games is a painful and frustrating process. And I was trying to <laughs> encourage everybody in the room to stop doing that because it is... Uh... <laughs> oh, he's just trying to stifle the competition, I think is what it is. Oh, well, yeah. What, what makes it so hard about designing uh, games? Is, is it, it's not the ideas. You're a very creative man. But I mean, what, what is it? Just going through the iteration and iteration of them? Why so would you... In, in a, explaining this in a one sentence to make it uh, super clear in, as a picture... From the moment when you start, and this is just like a barely even prototype, right? Till the moment you finished and the game is ready to print, whatever it is, a two months, if it was a simple game, or this is one year, if this is a big game, or if this is a three years, like in First Martians, for the whole time, let's say, let's say it was one year, this game is not working. Because when it, it's working, you send it to the print, right? So you're talking about a one year of frustration, basically. Because when it's done, it finally starts to work. But before it's done, it's not working. So for the every single day, every single week, you are frustrated that some parts of the game are still not working and you have to balance them and check them and change them. So basically, it is a one whole period of pain and frustration. And I strongly do this. this, this uh, no, no, don't do it. Don't, don't go this path. Oh, and let me just say, so next year at Gen Con, we, we need to talk beforehand because your seminars do not need to coincide with the Rolling Dice and Taking Name meetup. We need to we need to do a better job of scheduling. Yeah, that was yeah. Many many this is interesting because many fans of Portal Games are fans of your podcast. Like we we we, we have the same vibes and the same fa fans. And I was contacted on Twitter by a couple of people who said, "Oh my God, I wish I can go to the seminar, but we are at the meetup." So yes, that was. <laughs> Something that we didn't plan that uh, many fans of Portal Games are fans of your podcast and they had to choose and it was a hard choice for them. And they chose us? Uh, <laughs> some of them, yes. Some of them, no. <laughs> what we need to do next year is combine the two. So as we're doing our strike tournament, uh, Ignacy can be doing a seminar at the same time somehow. It's like we roll, he talk, roll, we talk. I don't know. We'll, we'll work it out somehow. I will say that you sound a lot better now than what you did when we first saw you on Wednesday when we showed up. Tony and I got there Wednesday and we walked over to your booth and you and uh, Jeff Patino and Chevy Dobb were just sitting there just very frustrated because as I looked around the booth, there were no first Martians in your booth at that time. And you guys were kind of freaking out because they had not shown up yet. There is ongoing pattern of uh, such events. Every single Gen Con we have adventure. I don't know if you recognize, but every single year you come to the booth and there is some mistakes happening uh, and there is no product uh, at on site. This year we were almost, almost there because uh, uh, before Gen Con we got confirmation that the games arrived to America. We got confirmation that they passed the customs. We get information that they are already in the Chicago. We got confirmation that they left Chicago to reach Indianapolis. Everything was super, super, super awesome. And then a day before Gen Con, we got information from our shipping company that the games indeed left Chicago. The games indeed reached Indianapolis, but the courier, the driver, made a mistake and didn't uh, note down where actually he left the game. So we know that the games <laughs> were left in Indianapolis, but they had no clue in which warehouse. And for the whole Wednesday morning, uh, Chevy was calling all warehouses in Indianapolis trying to nail down 
uh, our palette. So always adventure. This is these portal games, portal game, board games, detail stories. Always, every single year. Well, th- so they so they came in. You had more copies of First Martians this year than you had copies of Cry Havoc last year, correct? Yes, we had twice as many copies. And this is always a very interesting decision uh, for the publisher because there are, I would say there are two strategies, two policies when uh, coming to the booth, to the booth, to the vendor, to the show. Either you bring only a limited number of copies to hope for the getting amazing hype about the game that the game was sold out on the first day or something like that so you have only limited number of copies or you just go to the show to just sell as many copies as possible and there have many many people play the game after the show and create the hype so i would say there are two marketing marketing strategies and this year we went to bring as many copies of First Martian as we were able to, to just make people play the game, because we do believe that when people will play the game and they will say nice things about the game and the hype will grow. So, uh, yes, that this time we had exactly twice as many copies of the First Martians as the last year, Cry Havoc. And you sold out. We were sold out uh, on Sunday, last day, around the midday. I was able to send a tweet that, yes, we are sold out. So we are sold out, even though we had twice as many copies as uh, Cry Havoc. And uh, it was a very nice uh, uh, moment. And yes, now we have a few hundred people having first marches at homes. This is the first weekend after the Gen Con. So I am uh, super eager to know how many of these people will be able to open the box, to read the rulebook, to start the game. I expect some new questions on the BGG after this weekend, because for, for sure people will have some questions on BGG and yes the game once again will hit on the tables of many many new players and we will see if they like it or not I have a huge hopes it will be fine before we continue Mark I got a funny story I gotta tell you that was happening at the portal booth you gotta appreciate this so I'm standing there I'm looking at all the games and these people come up to Ignacy's booth and they're holding the games and you know I jump in there I'm trying to sell the man's product they're holding up Hiroshima they're holding up Imperial they're holding up 51st State I'm telling the the beautifulness of all those games then they hold up Robinson and the guy goes you know I just love this guy he is a great designer and I go yes Ignacy he's, he's an incredible designer I just don't know which one to pick and I'm go well you know they're all great he goes you know one day I hope to meet him and Ignacy is standing right there. <laughs> they don't have a clue. You, where, where is your shirt? Where's your shirt that says, I'm Ignacy? And I know yeah. you have the one on how to pronounce your last name, which I still need to um, get a copy of, by the way. And, and I am the designer who runs a vlog, who is very active on social media. Like yes. I, I, My face is everywhere. And this was part of the, my seminar for the game designers when I was trying to tell them not design games, don't do it. You will not be famous. You will not have a lot of fun, <laughs> fun girls going after you. Like It's not going to happen. Yes, People have no clue how the designer looks like and they don't want to take a selfie with him. Uh, of course, there are some hardcore fans who want to do that, and it is super, super nice. It was just amazing. I'm like, he's standing right there with an incredible shirt of First Martian. Where'd you get that? That was a sweet looking that was shirt. A, yeah, that was a gift from Mary, especially for the show. Oh, wow. Well, did you introduce him, Tony? Yeah. I said, there he is. If you buy this game, I'm sure he'll he'll sign it for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, like it's, it's your, they're selling stuff for him. That's good. Of course. I, you know me. I enjoy doing that. And Ignacy, I was playing a um, demo game over at Queen Booth, and I sat down with people who I actually demoed Crazy Carts with at Origins two years ago. That was hilarious. All right. So First Martians has been out just a lot, in a lot of people's hands. So you probably know better than anybody else what's been the reception of the game uh, oh wait one thing we need to correct marty you and i i think i didn't i didn't realize this in our last episode first martians isn't actually released to the public till the end of september right ignacy that's when it's going to be in the store that is that is correct there, there are three, actually four waves that we are doing in a four way so the first wave was the pre-orders people who pre-ordered from our website and they got the game in july then there was a release at Gen Con. We are talking about a few hundred people who were able to bought the game at Gen Con. Then at the end of the September, we have early launch kit. People can buy the game at the brick and mortar stores and have additional mission designed especially for this event. 
And then in the, at the beginning of October, actually there's a huge release worldwide with um, all online stores and Amazon and Barnes and Nobles and everybody will have the game. So we are doing four, uh, four waves. It is all because of the logistics and shipping and all that kind of stuff. So very complicated operation. This is our biggest production so far. So yeah, actually the game is not yet released, even though you see on social media so many people already playing the game. These are the hardcore fans who got to the game earlier. And how has it been received so far from those hardcore fans? That's that's super interesting interesting case to analyze. The first the first few days were very difficult for me, especially difficult because of course I am passionate and I am super attached emotionally to the project. There was so many questions and doubts about the rules, so I was basically sitting on a BGG website for the whole days and answering the questions. There was the first wave people who had some questions, some confusion, some doubts, and because the game was not yet released, these are the first first people, there was no watch it played video yet, there was no fuck yet, there was no answers on BGG yet, there was these first first days. So back then I had to be super super active and help people how to start, how to play, answer all the things to need to be cleared. And now it is so much easier. Now when people have watch it played video, now when in-app, because the game comes with the app, in-app you have a FAQ dedicated to every single mission. So depending on which mission you are playing, you will have a different FAQ in-app with answers for your questions, with many, many fans of the game who are already super active on BGG forums and they they answer questions faster than me. Uh, Now it is so much, so much easier. And now the reception is very, very nice. I received many, many emails and what is more at the Gen Con I, uh, I was approached for so many fans who said very nice things about the game it's uh, now I'm calm now I'm, I'm happy now I see that the game uh, uh, will have a lot of fans and of course it's not a game for everybody it's a very complex system uh, but I know that we have a very good product the, the first days when I'm, I only saw questions on BGG I was, I was, I was terrified that maybe Maybe we have some problem, but now I see we have no problem. It was just the initial initial release when there was no FAQ, no videos, no answers from fans. Now we are fine. And you fixed the issue that Marty and I discovered where it was so easy to win. Yeah, yeah. Back then it was a <laughs> it was a year ago, more than a year ago. You left me in despair, almost <laughs> crying. Like I met you and there was the main dish of the meeting. We play first Martians and you are finishing the game after 45 minutes. And well, it was easy, not, not challenging at all. Uh, you let, we, we said goodbye to each other. And then I went to my hotel absolutely destroyed and I had to finish it. This was once again, <clears throat> play testing is always frustration and uh, you always find things to fix. And there's like, you have these hopes, this time it will work, this time it will work. And then you play test, it doesn't work. And once again, it will work, it will work. It doesn't work. It is weeks and weeks and weeks of iterations. Yep, and you were part of the... (laughs) We were part of the frustration. Yeah. I do have a a question though. So uh, Rodney came out from, Rodney Smith from Watch It Play came out with this video. It's probably one of the longest videos he's ever done for a game. It's about an hour long. And there's there's a lot to this game. There's a lot to th- this rule book. Do you blind test? Do you ever just give the game to somebody who's never played the rule book, who's never seen it, and just see how it goes? Yep, of course. We do it. We did it with the uh, first Martians as well. And because after the game was released, there was so many questions on BGG about the rules, now all answered in the FAQ, uh, we had a very tense discussions uh, in company and with some of my friends uh, in the industry, also at the Gen Con, at the Game Designer ju- um, uh, Workshop, I stayed longer with Korni Konieczka from FFG, talking about how FFG is doing that. And uh, it's still too early because the game, it was like a few weeks ago when it, when it was released for the first fans. So we have to evaluate it uh, much longer and much more deep. But the first impression we have is that we blind test this to the people who are in the, I would say, I would call it circle of portal games, like my playtesters, like people who know portal games games, people who understand how portal games games work, like they feel maybe more than actually read. So playtesting in this circle maybe is of course good, but maybe we should reach to absolutely random people as well. And this was a very interesting insight that I had uh, at Gen Con after discussion with, with people from the industry that 
like I have uh, waves of different play testers when I develop the game and I'm looking for the more experienced and the less experienced for the random people and for the hardcore people like I'm looking for different play testers when I develop the rules uh, the conclusion was that I should probably look also for much more uh, different groups of blind play testers uh, I should not focus on, on people who are Portal Games fans because they naturally somehow uh, feel and understand how the games work and they know so many Portal Games games that they can understand how to play the game. So, uh, as I mentioned, it is a little bit too early to get the final conclusions, but the first, first uh, impression, first conclusion is that our play testing was uh, too much focus on the people who already know our products and we need to find absolutely random people who have nothing in common with our products and to see if they understand uh, what we are saying. All right, so first Martian, it's out the door. You've got it on the boat. It's coming to everybody. And at Gen Con, you had a demo going of Alien Artifacts. Now, we've been talking about it on the show periodically. Marty, didn't you see it at Origin? I, no, I saw. I played a demo of it last year at uh, BGG Con, and Ignacy said it has drastically changed uh, since then. But for those who had, have no idea what Alien Artifacts is, Ignacy, what's like a two sentence overview of what you're trying to achieve with Alien Artifacts? So, this is a. Uh a big card game, this engine building card game, like in Presetters of 51st State. These are the games I love to develop or design. So we are building your tableau. This game is a science fiction game. You are building a tableau of cards that represents your empire. You will be discovering a new planet that will give you resources. You will be developing new technologies that will, of course, break some rules and give you some super special powers. And you will be building warships to attack aliens or other players. And so basically we have three types of the cards, ships, technologies, and planets. Some of them give you resources, some of them give you power to attack, and some of them give you super cool abilities. And like in every single card game, you have to find the best synergies be 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 between cards you have in your tableau and cards you have in your hand, and find the best way to put them into the game and, and win the game. This is exactly the... Uh, type of the games me and Mary and people at Portal Games offices love to play. We love engine building card games, so uh, this is what we uh, love the most. Well, engine building sci-fi game, Tony, I assume you're right in there. Oh, yes. Well, I got to do this. Now, because you know, of uh, uh, not nothing taken away from Imperial Settlers. I love 51st State. That's, that, to me, is an engine, card, engine building card game as well. So is Alien Artifacts... I mean, how much different is it than from 51st State? That's where my mind immediately goes, Ignacy. How is it different? So this is a very interesting uh, case, and I would be super eager to see feedback of the players when the game is finally uh, released, because this is the game that was designed by uh, Marcin Robka and Viola Kioska. These are designers from Poland, and the game had nothing to do with Imperial Setters or 51st State. It's a uh, just submitted game, right? But mm -hmm. then, of course, the game landed on our desk, landed on my desk of developer, and I was developing the, ga the game uh, for a couple of months, and some uh, playtesters who, who playtested with me say they can see my touch, they can see my style of, of designing game, they can see that I changed this basic game a little bit, so they see some similar similarities to Imperial of 51st State. So I'm super eager how the feedback will be for the game. Like, at the very beginning, it was an uh, engine building game very different from the games we were releasing. Now people say they see some, some small touches and uh, it uh, looks like this is Portal Games game, that, like this, this stamp that is put on the, on the box. But basically, the whole system works totally different than uh, 51st State. So originally, it was kind of pitched to me that this was a 4X card game that plays in an hour or less. Is that still the same elevator pitch, or has it changed from that? Calling the card game 4X card game is uh, quite dangerous. I remember we talked about this last year when we met in Atlanta, and I was saying that I have 4X card game, but I'm afraid on naming that because it immediately opens uh, some uh, connections in brain and people will then say, wow, it's actually not 4X game. So uh, we are not, officially we are not calling it 4X card game. But to be honest, yes, this game that you are discovering and adding planets to your empire. Yes, you are building ships and with these ships you can attack either other players or you can attack non-player characters. This, that means aliens. Yes, you are developing technologies and each technology gives you special ability. So there is this feel of 4X card game. There is this feel of actually 
expanding your empire and exterminating opponents. There is all of that. But I'm afraid of calling it officially Forex card game because there'll be so much people saying, oh no, it's actually not Forex card game. Let's call it pure, cool sci-fi game. Like you have everything <laughs> you should have in sci-fi game. Aliens, warships, planets, technologies. This is what it is. Well, I'm glad I asked that because I, I've kind of had that in my mind too. And now Tony and I, now remember Tony, when I say 4X, you just stop me. We'll edit that out because I, I think that's good. I think you have a, a great idea. TI4 just came out, right? Yeah. So naturally they think, oh, TI4 4X. Oh, we're going to condense that to a board game. And I think, like you said, that just opened yourself up to criticism yep. that may not need to be there. I do like the idea of this is a sci-fi card engine building game. And if you've played Imperial Settlers or 51st State, you'll kind of know what we're talking about and just leave it at that and let people come to their own conclusions. That's 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 what our decision, exactly. And what I think was key to me here and what I'm picking up is when I think of 51st State, uh, I think of the resources, of moving the resources from card to card to card. Here, the resources are the are on the cards, right? We don't have little resource chits out there or anything that like correct. that, do we? Right. So, I mean, it's, I would have loved to have been able to demo this at Gen Con, but... The Why did you? You could have. You had four days. I no. I had three days. You keep thinking I was there Wednesday. That was Rodney. Okay. That was okay, not you had me. Three days. All right. I you had still three had three days. days. I, why, how could I? There were people at the table constantly. How were That's people taking? How were people taking the game? What what feedback did you get? I heard from one of our volunteers that at the BGG website there was some geek list. Uh, I don't know what kind of geek list it was, but apparently there was geek list for the best games presented at Gen Con that are not for sale. So all the games that were only for the demo. Uh, and this volunteer the, from Portal Games, the Herald, said uh, Alien Artifacts would on, w ended up as a third spot on this list, so very high. And I'm super happy considering the fact that we had this one table at our booth, and yet we managed to, to get that much attention. I'm super positive about the game. We were having a blast at Dice Tower Con when I was running the demos on two tables all day along for the four days of the Dice Tower Con. And now we had here one table at our booth running demos all day long again. And I'm pretty confident that Portal Games can do a very good card game. And this one, El you know, the fact is another one. Once again, you can play each card in a two different ways. So all people who love Imperial of 51st State would, will love that. You have resources, you have victory points, different ways to get victory points. Like, this is the stuff we can do. I'm super confident about this. First Martians even used, is a behemoth. It's It was a huge project with the app and a lot going on. So I love the idea that you've come out with this big behemoth campaign base game. And you're, you follow up on the hills with a game that falls more in line of like an hour you know 90 minute card game that's a little bit easier to pick up <laughs> because then right behind that i believe you announced earlier this year you have detective coming out which is probably going to be going back to another larger scale game yep exactly the case yes we are we are trying to surprise players with a different experience uh, and try different types of the game so we can reach different markets so this is exactly the case you talked about coming back from france and you were very excited about a game was any of these that are coming out one of those? Uh, I had we have a, we have a prototype uh, that uh, we hope to release next year. I don't know. I'm not sure if we will be ready for that for the next year. That is uh, amazing game. It is, what, it is not yet announced. We it was submitted to us for the designer who never had any game published yet. So this is a young designer, and the game on one hand is a super abstract. And the other hand, super thematic. If I can give any comparison, what I mean is like a Neuroshima hex, guys. You know that the game is very abstract, and yet mm -hmm. you feel that this is a battle, people are dying, but actually this is a puzzle, right? So this one uh, submitted to us, uh, it's not a war game, but uh, it is the same type of being abstract, and yet so much thematic. And the game uh, grabs me uh, immediately, and now we are... Uh, and negotiating with the designer uh, all the details and uh, trying to calculate the production cost to see how it will go. We will announce the game probably at Essen this year. But yes, I have uh, one game that we received that is super, super amazing. Yeah, I've never heard you so excited about a prototype. Yep. That's why I was just kind of curious yep. about that. But back to Alien Artifacts. 
When will we see it? Uh, we will see it in Essen. Of course, it's a big release for us, uh, European release. And uh, since I haven't been in the office from the Gen Con yet, so I'm going to office on Monday for the first time, so we'll, so I will know the, all the updates about when is the American release. I assume, of course, it's uh, after Essen, but I don't know if this is two weeks after Essen or three weeks after Essen, how much time we need to ship the games to America. Uh, but for sure, the game will be in America this year. And as I mentioned, European release in Essen and in America after the Essen. I don't know if this will be November or early December, or I, I don't know details yet. Uh, but for sure, this year, a big card game from Portal Games, and uh, this one should be huge. I'm super excited about this release. And it's on pre-order. It's available for pre-order right now, right? Yes, we have it for pre-order on our website. You can go to portalgames.pl and uh, pre-order. This is the same case as the last year with 51st State or this year with the first Martians. So this is offered for the most hardcore fans of Portal Games uh, because to pre-order the game from the publisher and having the game shipped from Poland it needs a little bit of courage and craziness. But if you do that, you will be super happy. I know that the feedback for 51st State campaign and for the First Martians campaign was super positive and people love that because for our fans, we're doing something like super small Kickstarter-ish thing. That means that the more pre-orders we have, we celebrate that with adding more and more small gifts to the game. So if you pre-order from our website, you will get at the very beginning, a little bit more than original release. So you have a, a special card with a different artwork. You will have a additional two factions for the game. Uh, you will get the game much more earlier and then a street, re street release. But what is more, as we go with the more and more pre-orders received, we will announce it and we will give a little bit more uh, to the game. This is uh, our way to gamify the whole pre-order system, to have fun with our fans and, and to appreciate them that they are pre-ordering from us. So this is our way of not doing Kickstarter, but having fun with our fans and giving them a little bit more than uh, regu regular pre-orders. And I'm sorry, I got to ask this, the PayPal thing. Are you still using PayPal or how are you doing it? Yeah, this is super, super, super funny, funny story because I still don't have my money. So people... Oh. What? Oh, you're kidding me. Yeah. So give we need a little bit of backstory for people who didn't hear. So so you had an issue with uh, PayPal where they basically closed your account and you couldn't get your money, right? Yeah, so the, we were getting money from First Martians pre-orders. And at some point, uh, PayPal contacted us and told us that because we are doing pre-order and we actually haven't... Uh, deliver the product yet to the customer they will hold the money till the moment we will deliver the product that was a a big mess because they not only blocked the, all our money from the pre-orders but they blocked the whole account so since uh, march 2017 uh, every single dollar the, that was paid for any product from portal games was held uh, which is ridiculous in my opinion uh, but anyway <laughs> finally we shipped the product after a few months so in july the product was sent uh, we informed PayPal that the product is delivered and we want our money to no longer be held. And then PayPal said uh, that we need to uh, prove it and they asked us to match every single order from our account with uh, a UPS number. So my employees spent a couple of weeks matching 3,000 orders on PayPal with 3,000 uh, tracking numbers from UPS. After a few weeks, we delivered the huge Excel file with matching all the all the numbers with all the orders, and now PayPal is processing it. So we are in the August, end of the August. The peop, many people already played the game, many people already finished the game, basically, and yet I have no money. This is ridiculous, but well, uh, lesson learned. I will I will never use PayPal again in my life. That's just stupid, absolutely stupid. And who owns PayPal? It's not eBay. Who owns them? No, really? I think it is, or either the other way around. eBay. I know a guy at eBay. <laughs> <laughs> Go, yeah, that one guy, I'm sure, will take care of it. Yeah. That, oh, yeah, I, I think, I think that one guy has a lot of. He's part of a podcast that has a lot of listeners. A lot <laughs> of listeners. <laughs> so yeah, we we may have to work on that. Hey, don't mess with don't mess with our buddies, PayPal. Come on now. Get, get on stick. So who, you, are you, you're not going to use them for this one, are you? Yes, we are. We, from, from our website, there is, there is no way to use PayPal anymore. Uh, we are not happy with this, with this partner. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the lucky situation, the lucky thing is that 
uh, Portal Games is a big enough company that we were able to do production, we were able to deliver the product, and of course the situation is not super comfortable to have so many, so much money hold, but we can operate. But if the, if the company would be smaller, if it would be somebody else, it can basically end uh, the life of the companies, and this is really, really difficult. That's why, that why I, I went public on that, that's why I was talking about this on a, a podcast to warn smaller publishers that uh, these pre-orders and paper doesn't work together uh, at all, so they have to know that. Well, so uh, Alien Artifacts is now available for pre-order. It ends in uh, middle September, right, the pre-order? That is correct. We finish pre-orders on 18th of September and then the production starts and then we soon after we can ship the games to the uh, people who pre-ordered the game. Uh, I strongly recommend to at least uh, check out our website because you can find our rule book, you can find all the details about the game, some artwork, and you can consider if you are interested in pre-ordering from us with the additional factions and additional cards, etc. Well, I'm I'm very excited about it. I, I love the the sound or the the changes sounds like you've made since uh, BGG Con. Um, I, I love your uh, engine building games. I love your card based games. So I'm a, I'm very excited to play Thank it. You. Uh, First Martians, obviously a huge success. I think Alien Artifacts will be as much of a success because it's one of those games that I think it's going to be more accessible to a lot of people. I think it's one of those that people will just be able to pick up, play in an hour. Uh, you won't need an hour long video from Rodney. He could probably knock this thing out. Watch this. I bet Rodney could do a video in 20 minutes for this game. Will he accept the challenge? Probably not. Um, <laughs> and then, okay, so Tony, I, I say we close this out with uh, each of us get to ask one question, Tony, okay? And I'll let you go first because you and I may have the same question. So you go first, and in case you have the same question, I'll have to come up with another one. Okay, well, I'm tell you, what, I'm going to let you go because I'm I've got so many questions for Ignacy, and uh, and then right, maybe then, you, you then maybe you can narrow down one question into multiple questions. Because, okay, uh, my my questions are basically about things that's that's you know what are you working on and stuff. And before we recorded it, we was asking about expansions and blah. I mean, Ignacy is constantly working on something, but. The question I have is actually not exactly from Portal, but in collaboration with Stephen Bonacore from Stronghold Games. Where's our Stronghold expansion? Oh my God. I knew it. You, you know, we love Stronghold. We yeah. absolutely love Stronghold. Yeah, on a serious note, the, uh, from, my, from my side, the expansion is ready. I gave all the files um, uh, to my artwork team. And then uh, first Martians and Alien Artifacts happened. And because of our collaboration with Cool Me or Not, you guys have to remember that Portal Games is also doing a lot of games for Polish market. Mm -hmm. And these amazing games from Cool Me or Not taking lots of time of my artwork department. Uh, so doing all these Polish editions of Godfather and Blood Rage and Zombie Seed, etc. It takes a time. So yes, and it was postponed and it was delayed on my... Actually, to be honest, I don't even remember how the expression is working. Like it was so many months ago when I finished the project and finished playtesting. And yes, it's still sitting on the on the computer of my artwork team. And I don't know when it will be ready. Uh, if I can finish with the good news, if I can finish with the, some uh, light in this in this in this uh, answer, I have a project that at this point is called something like Stronghold. Uh, uh, I don't know how to call it. Basically, much faster. I like, get uh, to play the Stronghold in 45 minutes. Oh! Uh, super, super engaging, super fun. Um, I was challenged by uh, by one of our partners if I can do a Stronghold that is playable much more faster and is like a Stronghold for the easier, for the much, much mass market audience. Uh, and I did it, and it works, and it is super fulfilling. So at some point we'll have also something like Stronghold to be able to be played at the convention actually. Like you can play in 45 minutes, understand the rules and have a great time and still have a great, great experience. So there is, there is that. Okay. So after hearing all that, I'm just going to, Tony, I'm just going to say, let's blame Bonacore. What do you think? I'm good with that. He'll all right. Take so anything. since he's not here, it's, it's Bonacore's fault. Okay, Tony, go ahead. All right. Did you ever, Ignacy, did you ever see the movie starring uh, American actor named Rodney Dangerfield, Back to School? Did you ever see that movie? No. Okay, then this will be useful. <laughs> so anyway, in there, he does an exam. And at the end of it, the professor looks at him and says, I have one question. And he goes, oh, thank goodness. And he goes, but it's got 27 parts. So are you ready? Yes. One of my big questions for you is part A, 
what is Ignacy working on? What what is your what is in your design mind? I, I love Ignacy games. I mean, what are what's in your mind? What what's getting ready to hit the table from Ignacy? At this very moment, uh, like literally this weekend, I'm working on the long promised campaign for the Robinson Crusoe. So mm. we are done with the project First Martian for some time. I have uh, the game is released, First Martian is released, and I have uh, already designed two new missions for the player. So after the release of the game, there will be two updates for the game. And now I move to the Robinson, back to the Robinson Crusoe, and I'm working on the campaign. We'll start teasing it once again in Essen. And I have a very, very long list of uh, expansions that I should finish. Uh, which is uh, more and more problematic every single year because uh, every single year I have another title on the market and every single year I have uh, new fans of this product and every single year I have to deliver a new expansion. So yes, we have uh, 51st state expansions in the work. I have Imperial Settlers expansion in the work. I have, as I mentioned, Robinson Crusoe expansion in the work. I have this super secret project that was not yet announced, but it is teased on many, many interviews that I'm working with Eric Lang on the game. Uh, I have this super secret prototype we already talked to develop like there is so many many things to do at this point and yes we are at the stage we are at the moment for the portal games company that um, I am very actively looking for the people to work at portal games in a development team like my playtesters circle and uh, my time I definitely need more people in development team because there's so many lines so many game lines to support with the expansions and there is no longer Mr. Ignacy can do it by, by himself. Oh, come on now. Don't sell yourself short. We know you can. Yeah. We'll yeah. see. Yeah, uh-huh. Um, so part B, with all those expansions... <laughs> Tony, it's only supposed to be an hour podcast here. Oh, we can forgo game interviews. This is Ignacy. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, so part B, with all those expansions, we know you've also got the, the Cry Havoc, and you said 51st State and all that. You said secret games, or is it... Exp I, uh, oh, so I, I'm going to leave it alone. I'm what sorry. are you talking about? I, I, uh, be, uh, expansion. Ah. I'm just trying to... I just want, Clarify I want to your drop B the bomb. questions. Succinct questions. Succinct questions. That's not me, and you know that. Oh, Lord. oh by the way, I went back and read... Um, I'm reading Robinson right now due to your suggestion, Ignacy. Try and read the book before I play the game. I, I like that. That's kind of cool. Have you read that book yet, Romarty? Robinson? What's your part B question? Okay, fine. <laughs> fine. Mary's not there. I was going to ask Mary. Well, she's there. She's waiting on him to score. I was going to see who is cuter in the, in the squirrel costume, you or me? She knows. She's seen, a, she's seen both pictures. I saw only Marty in the costume, and it left a lot of memories for my whole life. Like, that was... Scarred memories. Now when you got back, you probably had to find a therapist to go talk to. I mentioned, I mentioned when we met at Gen Con, at the random hours of a day, Mary was starting <laughs> laughing at the random moments, and she said, oh, I just, I just saw Marty again in her, in, her, in her mind. So, yes, you left a lot of memories that Mary had as well. Uh, that was ridiculous. I strongly recommend everybody to go to social media and find pictures of Marty in this suit. It was ridiculous. Um, great, great idea. Well, if the budget allows in our show, I may get one. He and I can both walk around the thing in squirrel suits. Anyway, Ignacy, Essence coming up. What's up next? Well, uh, I, I, ho I was hoping for the vacation. Nope. It's not going to happen again. No vacation. Sorry. Yep. Yep. No, that's that's the case. Yes, we, yep. As I mentioned, I have to finish the Robinson Crusoe campaign. I have to finish Imperator's expansion, 51st State expansion. This stupid undead has to go to print. Like, there's so many things to do. The only good thing about all of that is that I, I really like the, my job and I really like doing that. So I'm super, super happy. And actually, I never wanted to have vacation. So I'm fine. I'm still in a very good mood. I have a... A growing team because uh, each year we we are hiring more and more talented and nice people from 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 Portal from Poland. You can probably see it on uh, Portal Games Informant, the vlog we are recording each week, so you can see my team in work. Uh, so, so yes, no vacations, but uh, new great games next next year and already i'm excited about the next year it's always the same case that when you are receiving the new products like first mentions on in a couple of weeks alien artifacts my mind will be already in the 2018 and i will be uh, working very very hard about the new projects and i will be excited about the new projects which is always 
quite confusing for me to being excited about the project like first march and they actually finished the year before right so it is always this delay before between me designer and publisher and you customer who just received the game i forgot about a year, a year earlier and uh just because i haven't heard it mentioned in your in your future plans are we still looking to see a detective a modern crime board game come out in 2018 yeah detective is our it will be yes detective detective will be uh, one of our two major releases of the next for the next year the other one will be announced at Essen. i can i can uh, tease that it will be game by michael orach oh. so this designer of naroshima hex so we have uh, we have new game from Michael Orach, and we'll have Detective, uh, two big releases for the next year, and then uh, depending on the time and uh, how development will go, we'll have a new game with me and Eric Lang, and we may have the mentioned earlier prototype. So we have four games in the works, and depending on how it will go, we will have uh, between two or four releases next year. Wait a minute, did he did he just say Eric Lang again? He had a game with Eric Lang. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, did uh, you not see that uh, cool picture of he and uh, Eric looks like a album cover? No, I missed that one. Oh, it's really good. It's he and Eric sitting out, uh, standing out in the middle of a street, and it's a black and white picture, and it looks like you know this is like these are two guys in a band. It's a really cool looking pic. Okay, well that's yeah. cool. When's Portal Con? Is that um, January or February? Portal Con in January, at the very beginning of the year. We are announcing all our titles. Uh, great event. Uh, this. Uh, PortalCon in 2018 will be 10th edition of PortalCon, so we are uh, making it uh, much bigger with the super fancy ballroom with the seminars and uh, all that uh, amazing thing. So yes, the next PortalCon will be huge for us. And make sure to live stream your announcement so everybody across the world can watch. Yes, uh, we, we did it uh, two years ago and uh, last year we didn't, we didn't do this. Uh, we definitely should do this. That's, so I uh, totally agree, yes. Yep. Cool. And, and I'm kind of curious, how difficult is it for a non-Polish speaking individual to attend PortalCon? Is it going? Would it be like terrible? No, we we, we each year we have a couple of uh, our fans from the from the Europe. Uh, flight tickets in Europe are not that expensive, so coming for for a PortalCon from Italy or from Germany or from the Spain is not that big a cost. And for these players, it's a one day filled with the absolutely craziness about the portal games all people playing portal games games most of our fans speak english fluently because uh, they are gamers so of course they use board game gig of course they uh, listen to the podcast so uh, so they are fluent in english so there's no problem with playing games and as i mentioned like uh, for the for the people hardcore fans of portal games from germany or france or italy there is not a big deal to come to us so every single portal con we have a couple of people from different countries i'm trying to see if i can get it worked in the rdtm budget for marty and i to fly to portal con in january it might be a little cold but that'd be fun that would be a blast i know a guy who's got a place over there i got a feeling we could crash on his floor probably could but i just i did find out uh i hope he's still forgiving me because uh on that first day okay, we talked about gen con and beth from over at stronghold games makes these incredible desserts and she makes these yep. things called chocolate bombs and yep. ignasi had a big container of them and i didn't feel like walking over to the stronghold booth to get one and i took one out of that container you fool. and I know, Ignacy. I, I, if if looks could kill, I wouldn't be talking right now because Ignacy looked at me like, "What the heck are you doing?" And I'm like, "I'm, I'm sorry, I just was kind of lazy." So do not touch Ignacy's cookies. Let's 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 put it in the right picture. The <laughs> container was hidden be, behind <laughs> the box of the games. It was not on the display. You went and found it in the super secret place. That is correct. Well, Jeff did kind of point me in that direction, so I will deflect yeah, some of this sure. to Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> so, and we're going to let you go, but I want to know, I know the little one was with you at Gen Con. What game did you get for her? What game have you, did you get Super Rhino? We, we, brought, we, we brought for her the game that is not available in Poland and the game that she will love. We haven't played it yet. It is Harry Potter from West Opoli. Uh, Harry Potter, the deck building game. Uh, she loves Harry Potter, obviously, and the game is not available in Poland. And for us, it's a win-win situation because it is a very simple deck builder game, but yet it uh, has some text on the card. So we will encourage Elena to study English playing the game. And it is a cooperative game, so all our kids can play. So for us, it was absolutely winner. Cooperative game about Harry Potter. 
and uh, additionally small lessons of English. So winner for us. All right. So Ignacy, I know you do a lot of things with uh, videos and uh, vlogs and podcasts. Uh, if people want to go listen to you or watch you, where can they find you? Yeah. So you can find if you are li listening to the podcast, you can find me at Board Games Insider. This is a podcast I'm recording with uh, Mr. Bonacor from So Called Games. It's a 30 minute a podcast a be weekly recorded and if you're using youtube and if you're look, looking for the vlogs uh, i'm recording portal games informant this is a weekly show about portal games uh, company we are recording uh, each week is about six minutes to eight sometimes a longer episode takes 10 minutes but usually it's about seven minutes long and uh, this documentary show we record some uh, footage from our company showing how we play test the games how we have business meetings, how we play together, like all the things that happening in the Portal Games offices. I have a one employee, Marek, whose uh, main job is uh, just running uh, around the offices with the camera and uh, doing some sort of chronicle. And uh, for me, is a super interesting concept because on one hand, uh, for you viewers, it is a sneak peek to actual our offices to see me at work, to see my artwork department at work, to see our prototypes play tested. Uh, but for me, Mm, uh, what I learned when we started recording this, it is actually chronicle of our life, chronicle of our, our company. And now we are releasing alien artifacts and you can literally find uh, episodes in the internet from the February or March when you can see me struggling with the game and complaining that the game is not working and uh, still struggling. And now the game is uh, in, in the manufacturing level. So when I think about this tool, like this is a chronicle of Portal Games and how we were developing the games, if I had a chance to see videos of me designing Robinson Crusoe back then in 2012 and having these hopes that maybe it will be a good game and now knowing that the game was so successful or seeing me when I was dropping the college and uh, founding the company and being super young dude to have these dreams that uh, he will build a company and struggling with the finances and you know distribution etc like Having a chronicle of your company is something super, super interesting for me. So on one hand, uh, I do believe that we give uh, a very interesting content for the viewers, seeing us at work. But for me, it's a great chance to look at these videos in 10 years or in 20 years and see us uh, basically doing our best to create great games. You know, it might be an interesting project, and I know it would be hard is to go back through those videos and, and put together the bits and pieces of like a documentary of alien artifacts and release it in one video. Video yep. to show from beginning to end. So it's a good idea. Yeah, when all Alien Artifacts comes out, you can see Alien Artifacts, the documentary, which I think would give it a really interesting process. What's exciting is I'm going to get to see you in November at PAX U, where 30 yep. to 40,000 people will be, and hopefully you'll have some copies of Alien Artifacts there to sell. Yeah, so for, for us, it will be the first America show with Alien Artifacts released. We will have a booth there. We sh for sure will have uh, Alien Artifacts there. Uh, I will be there for the whole convention promoting the game, playing with the fans, uh, Alien Artifacts. I will be doing seminars again. So if people want to hear mo more of my Slavic accent in real life, <laughs> they can come to seminars and try to understand me. Uh, I, I assume it will be lots of fun. First time me in this region of America. I've never been in the north of America yet. Mm, I have never been in PAX yet. So a lot of a new experience for me. Mm, and yes, it will be another long flight, which I don't like, but then amazing, amazing fun. Fantastic. Can't wait to see. You got a lot of great games coming out. Again, go check out Ignacy and Portal Games at portalgames.pl. Thanks, Ignacy. We all love getting our games to the table, but sometimes the setup can be such a downer. Oh, it can crush your soul and might even keep a game on the shelf, one that deserves some love. So if you've got a game you love and the only thing that might be keeping it from getting played is set up, then why don't you head over to The Broken Token and see if they don't have something designed to help you speed up the setup. If they do, purchase it. That's right, from The Broken Token. <laughs> Buy it! You'll be so happy you did! Either way, be sure to head over to thebrokentoken.com. Five minute initiative begins in three, two, one. Number nine by Z Man Games is this abstract game that abstract does not do well for me. 
I just, <laughs> I'm sorry, Marty. I do, I can't do it. I cannot. Pro- I mean, we, no, it's not the it's not the abstract thing. It's the Tetrisy type that, thing yes. because oh. this game, this this game has uh, basically ten tiles in all of them shaped like numbers zero through nine, and there's two of each tile, and it's a stacking game and a laying out game, and you don't tend to do very well. With no, this. I don't do very well at this. Now I have one. I beat Donna the first game, but once she got uh, her head around how these numbers were, she kicked my butt in the second game so i mean what you're trying to do is when a card is pulled of the number you have to take that number from the pile and you have to lay it out and you're trying to build up a little la- layers right marty of t- of these numbers that these are tetrises and you score points now level zero scores you no points yeah so the very bottom layer is basically worth zero points so if all your tiles are on the first layer you scoring zero you scoring zero and i tend to i can i can put them together on the zero level I got no problems with that. But what makes it uh-huh. unique is in order to place a tile, they have to touch. They, they cannot touch on the diagonal. They have to touch sides. You know, a square touches a square. But when you stack them up in number nine, you cannot have any open spaces underneath it. It has to have a firm foundation on these numbers. And Marty, that's what, because they're so odd shaped. Oh my gosh. It, <laughs> For such a simple game, it hurts my brain. Yeah, the thing is, if some people get confused when it can can you have like tiles, you know, overhanging. It's like no, there can never be any air gap under any tile that you lay, whether it be a gap under in the number that's underneath it, or you can't have it overhanging. So you got to lay this foundation down that has a lot of solid surface area, and then start building on top of that. And so uh, the base level is worth zero points. The level above it is worth one point times whatever that tile is. So for example, if you have a three tile on that next level, three times one is three, but you take all those on that level and add them up. Well, if you're really, really good, it can form a solid, firm foundation on that next layer. You can build another layer on top of that. And now those are worth two times whatever that tile's value is. So uh, it's very, it's kind of like to me, totally like a Karuba, right? Where you have these deck of 20 cards and everybody's doing the exact same thing. Right. You flip over a card, everybody takes that number. So everybody's working with the exact same number each turn. And after 20 turns, after all the tiles have been played, you score from top to bottom and the person with the most points wins. Now, it's a very simple game. It's that pamphlet rule game that, you know, we said we could flip back and forth and it's easy to follow. But it's one that I know you you were like, eh, but I had fun because when, <laughs> when our flight was delayed at Gen Con for two hours, we happened to have access to this game. We got a couple other guys and we sat there on the floor of the airport at the terminal and we played like three or four games of number nine and everybody had a really good time. It's a fun game. I, I will always play it even though I suck at it. I mean, I know for an audio podcast, it's like, what are they talking about? So, I mean, think of it like this. The zero has a hole in the middle. And we just said you can't have holes underneath. So you've got to be very particular where you place the zero. And then as you move up to the number nine, nine is almost solid. I mean, think of how the numbers are formed. Seven is a bear. It's all crooked and (laughs) zagged and oh. So is Zagged. it Zagged. There's a new term. I've got a new term. So the the whole concept, you've got to see these numbers and it will, it'll take you a couple plays to just figure it out. And because as you're drawing these numbers come out, I mean, building it's like, oh, you'll be this, it will, I'll always develop this pattern. No, it's because when these cards come out, you can have back to back to zeros. You can, you don't know how they're going to come out. So it can really mess up your game plan. Now for me, I'm going to keep the game. I enjoy playing the game. My wife loves this game. She loves these puzzle games. And it's a game she will always beat me at. Yeah, this is one of those games that it's hard not to recommend to have on people's shelves because of the simplicity of the game. The setup is a piece of gate cake. You literally just, you leave the numbers in the box and you just take out a deck of cards and you shuffle them and you're off and running. You can combine two boxes together. So if Tony, if I have a box and you have a box and you can have like eight people playing at one time, uh, we actually did that at, at a Gen Con. So it supports multiple players. Um, and takedowns easy. Everybody just throws their uh, cards back into the nice little insert, which holds all the, uh, the pieces. Uh, Easy to teach for casual gamers. I highly recommend if you got friends and family that aren't in a lot of gaming but like little puzzle games. I think this this is it. This was a this was a hit at uh, Gen Con. I've seen people playing it before. So if you're looking for a fun little quick casual abstract game, this is the one. Check out. This is number nine from Z Man Games. Five minute initiative is complete.
Marty, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm going on vacation. Woo! You're always going on vacation. I got to use it. You were gone all the time. Hey, you've got, if you don't use it, you lose it. And this is the big one. This is a huge vacation we've been planning. So I will be, you don't know when and where it's going to happen, but I will be over in Europe. If you're near, is it, uh, I won't say Cologne. I'm pretty sure it is. That's it. Yep. I will be there. Um, so if you happen to be around and see this guy walking around completely clueless, that's a typical me, then say hello. I've got to find a game shop. I, I, I can't. I, if you don't find a game store over there, I'm going to be sorely disappointed. And if you want to stand out, why don't you take the squirrel onesie with you and just say, hey, look for the guy wearing the squirrel onesie. Hey, luggage. Luggage is an issue. I will, okay. I will, I will do this. I, I got to find one because I do want to pick up x uh, it hasn't made it over to the States yet. And I'm hoping that I, if I do go into a game store, that there will be a whole case of strike and I can take my picture next to it. Actually, <laughs> you might want to, if that's possible and you got room in your luggage, you might want to pick up a couple of copies and bring it over here and sell them. That'd be worth a lot of money. I know. I'm thinking of that. I'm thinking of that. So, you know, next episode, I don't, uh, how are you going to handle this? What do you, what are we going to talk about if I'm on vacation before you go on vacation we're just going to have to uh record a couple segments together you and i have gotten together and played some other games so and this was kind of a longer episode thanks to ignasi and his for a man who doesn't speak english he can sure talk (laughs) (laughs) you know he's getting more comfortable it was was very informative we we got a lot out of him but hey you and i have a game that we're excited to try uh, from passport game studios that was one of the hot games at Gen Con, and that's Professor Evil and the Citadel of Time. You and I have played it. We have our thoughts on it. So we're going to have a segment in the next episode where we talk about that game and one of the most highly anticipated games I had from Gen Con with Code Names Duet. Both Tony and I got a copy. Uh, we played uh, together. We play with our wives. And in our next episode, we'll do a five-minute initiative on it. So we've got some content coming in the next episode. But with you on vacation, I'm just going to have to do my best to fill it in with something else, and we'll just see how it goes. So maybe you can get some bids. Maybe that's, ooh, that's an extra life campaign. Come on and co-host with Marty, or maybe you can trick somebody into coming and filling my shoes. It won't be hard to fill my shoes. Uh, actually, it, it, it will be. People are intimidated when they come in oh. and sit in your chair. Uh, that's only because it's warm from getting nervous and sweaty from saying, oh, man, how am I going to screw up this up? How often am I going to say neat? They're intimidated by back sweat. That's, that's, uh, how else? They got to get neat in there in any way and all those other good catchphrases I have. Yeah, there's a lot of little things that got to do neats and they got to do so. And, so, you know. so yes, I'm very excited about that. Like, there's Once one. Again, I'm all going on vacation. Always scares the bejeebus out of me because what am I forgetting? Things like that. But I'm looking forward to it. I do, and you know, I know there's games workshops over there, actual stores. Yeah, well, there's games workshops here. There's one in Charlotte. There is on right beside UNCC. Yeah, I might need to get out more. You do need to get out more because uh, they got Necromunda coming out that was just announced, and I know you're like, oh, whatever. But Rodney Smith of Watch It Play is telling me about this game, and it's like one of his favorite games of all time. And I'm really curious to see how this small number of models, quick skirmish game, compares to a game that you and I are also interested in, Company of Iron from privateer press which is also their version of a quick skirmish small number of model games and i listened to an interview with them the other day uh when i was at gen con i asked them so you're going to release this company of iron october and it's a starter set with all these models i said look we already have models i don't need those i just want the rules and stuff and they were like kind of hemming and hawing well since then they've decided they will be releasing the rules and the uh, deck of cards that you need to play this game so tony with just one rule book and some cards, you and I can pull the models off the shelf that's been collecting dust and try this game. And I'm very curious to see how this works as a quick skirmish game compared to Necromunda that will also be coming out in uh, November and they'll be going head to head. So I can't wait to uh, play that with you sometime and actually get some use out of those models I've had painted for all those years. Oh, I'm very excited for that. Uh, I enjoyed the Privateer Press. I, I love the War Machine. I don't know why, what it was. I, maybe it's because it was our first miniatures. It was. I love the universe. I mean, we sat there and went between Malifaux and Privateer Press. We knew that the uh, Necromunda, the, the Games Workshop, was 40K was out of our league at the time. So, yeah, I guess that's why. But, you know, guess what I'm going to be doing on the plane? What's that? I'm going to be reading 
the Lord of the Rings RPG. Yes! Finally! Cue the music! We're going to do this! I, I know Cubicle 7, they just also released the PDF of some of their scenarios and expand the universe, but I'm also going to have my star trek rpg with me so when i start glossing over about elves and no, stuff I, I ain't playing i ain't playing that music you will oh you can i don't want to engage <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got now these books are heavy so that's gonna hurt, hurt my back a little bit as i carry them around but i don't have the pdfs of those well i do have the lord of the rings but not of the star trek but i'm excited I've I've got twelve hours in a plane or whatever. It's unreal. I am disappointed that I won't be in Germany during Essen, but you and I will get there someday. But I'm more excited. You know, Ignacy, I asked him point blank about PortalCon. I would so love to do PortalCon. I think that'd be yeah, that'd be just so much fun. It'd be cold. I'm sure, but but Ignacy, well, he he's got blankets. I'm sure we can sleep I'm on sure. his floor. It'll it'll happen. It'll happen. Well, have fun without me. I know you will. And I'm sure you'll figure out how to keep rolling dice and taking names. If you'd like to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Dice and Names. Join our Facebook page, Roll Dice, Take Names. Come join our BGG Guild, 1589. And come back next episode when we review Professor Evil and the Citadel of Time plus Codenames Duet. Uh, guys, guys, hello, I'm, I'm, I'm still here, Marty, Tony, oh, this is the worst birthday ever. Gen Con is over, thank you. Gosh, it's over. But now the what? So bitter. I, I'm not bitter. I'm, I wanted the new game. So, if you're like me and didn't have luggage room from Gen Con or you didn't make it to Gen Con, be sure to go over to FunAgain.com. They've got a bunch of pre-orders sitting out there. Pandemic Legacy Season Two is out there on pre-order. I'm so excited. Star Wars Rebellion, the expansion, Marty. Pre-order. Did you see uh, Pandemic Rise of Tide? Hmm? No, it was deleted. Your tweet was deleted. This is the fun again commercial. We don't need to go into any show stuff. We can save that for the next show. Anyway, I'm sorry. if you want to check out all these games, they've got the new releases in. They've got the pre-orders ready to go. And then, of course, Nick will have you set up for Essen. He will start getting that together, the list of games he needs to bring back. So be sure to go over to funagain.com for all your gaming needs. Gaming needs.